Hello and welcome to volume 14 of the Massey Ferguson Archive series. This programme is a little different from previous instalments because we're going to take a closer look at the cultivating, planting and harvesting of sugarcane. Although sugar can be grown in Europe, it often comes from a crop called sugar beet, which despite becoming the main source of sugar for continental Europe by the 1880s, only really gained popularity in Britain during the First World War. It is planted in the spring, then the roots of the beet are harvested in the autumn and winter. Various machines have been developed over the years to harvest sugar beet roots, from early models that harvested just a single row at a time, to the huge sophisticated machines of today which can harvest up to 12 rows at a time. But before the arrival of the sugar beet on British shores, all the country's sugar was acquired from a completely different source, sugar cane. Today, the majority of the world's sugar is still provided by the cane crop, grown in the warmer areas of the world, such as Australia, South Africa, America and the Caribbean. This MF20 cane planter plants cane in straight rows with even spacing, which is a necessary prerequisite if high outputs are to be achieved by mechanical harvesters. These two men are planting at a rate of one acre an hour. In one operation, the MF20 opens the furrow, cuts the cane into 14-inch pieces, dips them into a mercurial fungicide, places them in the furrow, applies fertilizer, and covers the sets with a uniform depth of soil. Time taken from opening to closing the furrow is only two seconds, so loss of moisture is practically negligible. See how the seed pieces are placed in the bottom of the furrow at an even depth. Even in these dry soil conditions, moisture present is retained. In Australia, it's general to plant cane at the rate of about two long tons per acre, about one third of the worldwide average planting rate. In any circumstance, this is a real saving. Ruggedly constructed, the MF20 has many excellent features that make it ideal for hard working in heavy soils. For our last film, we travel to North America for an exclusive glimpse at the workings of the Agricultural Division of Massey Ferguson as they discuss their vision for the 1970s. Now keep your eyes peeled for a sneak look at the ideas for some machines that later appeared and others that never did. The last part of Dave's message is perhaps the most significant the fact that we are in the process of implementation. Design of these R extractors began in early 1970. By December 1970, the styling concept and the general specifications of the new tractors were approved. In fact, these scenes were filmed during that meeting. Let us again look at the products which we plan to introduce progressively over the next five years. The initial upgrade of the MF-165 through 178 tractors introduces improved operator comfort, the cast iron rear axle, independent PTO, and increased power. The new features will reduce the product gap to competition and permit operations units to launch aggressive product promotion programs in 1972. The MF-148, to be launched in February-March 1972, provides coverage of the vital 45 to 60 horsepower sector. The TX-266 Combine, the first of Massey Ferguson's new generation of combines for world markets, will be introduced in North America during 1972. The remainder of the family will follow rapidly. Late 1975, for 1976 sales, we will introduce the MF-366, the first European version of the new Worldwide Combine Series, to be followed by the 365, 364, and an economy version of the 364. Another important product introduction will occur in March 1972, when we introduce the first equal wheel, articulated four-wheel drive agricultural tractor into the European markets. <laughs> 